Content warning. The following video contains material that may be harmful or traumatizing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Some of you may have heard that this Disney Corporation is responsible for at least one real live ghost town. Disney built the Treasure Island Resort in Baker's Bay in the Bahamas. It didn't start as a ghost town. Disney's cruise ships would actually stop at the resort and leave tourists there to relax in luxury. This is a fact. Look it up. Disney blew $30 million on this place. Yes, $30 million. Then they abandoned it. Disney blamed the Shadow Waters. And there was even a blame cast on the workers saying that since they were from the Bahamas, they were too lazy to work a regular schedule. That's where the factual nature of the story ends. It wasn't because of sand, and it obviously wasn't because of foreigners are lazy. Both are convenient excuses. No, I sincerely doubt the, those reasons are legitimate. Why don't I buy the official story? Because of Mogili's place, palace, near the beachside city of Emerald Isle, Isle in North Carolina, Disney began construction of Mogili's palace in the late 1990s. The concept was a jungle-themed resort with a large, you guess it, palace in the center of the whole thing. If you're unfamiliar with the character of Mowgli, then you might or better remember the story, The Jungle Book. If you haven't seen it anywhere else, you know it as the Disney cartoon from decades past. Mowgli was, is an abandoned child in the jungle, essentially raised by animals and simultaneously threatened by other animals. Mowgli's pl palace was a co controversial undertaking from the start. Disney bought up a ton of high-priced land for the project, and there was actually a scandal surrounding some of the purchases. The local government claimed amendment domain on people's homes, then turned around and sold the properties to Disney. At one point, a home that had just been constructed was immediately condemned, with little to no explanation. The land grabbed by the government was supposedly for some fictional highway project. Knowing full well what was going on, people started calling it Mickey Mouse Highway. Then there was a concept art. A group of stuffed shirts from Disney Co. actually held a city meeting. They intended to sell everyone on how lucrative this project was going to be for everyone. Then they showed the concept art in gigantic Indian palace, surrounded by jungle, staffed with men and women in lion cloths and tribal gear. Well, suffice to say, everyone flipped their shit. We're talking about a large Indian palace, jungle, and lion cloths, not only in the center of relatively wealth area, but also somewhat a xenophobic area of southern USA. It was a questionable mix at that point in history. One member of the crowd tried to storm the stage, but he was quickly subdued by security after he managed to break one of the presentation boards over his knee. Disney took that community and essentially broke it over its knee as well. The houses were raised, the lane was cleared, and there wasn't a damn thing anyone could do or say about, about it. Local TV and newspapers were against the resort at the beginning, but... Some insane connection between Disney's media holdings and the local venues came to play, and their opinions turned on a dime. So anyway, Treasure Island, the Bahamas. Disney sunk those millions in it and then split. The same thing happened with Mowgli's Palace. Construction was complete. Visitors actually stayed at the resort. The surrounding communities were flooded with traffic and the usual annoyances associated with an influx of lost and irrit tourists. Then it all just stopped. Disney shut it down, and nobody knew what the hell to think. But they were pretty happy about it. Disney loss was pretty hilarious and wonderful to a large group of folks who didn't want this in the first place. I honestly didn't give the 
place another thought since hearing it closed over a decade ago. I live maybe four hours from Emerald Isle, so really, I only heard the rumblings and didn't experience any of it firsthand. Then I read this article from someone who had explored Treasure Island Resort and posted a whole blog about all the crazy shit you found there. Stuff just left behind, things smashed, defaced, probably ruined by disgruntled former employees who had lost their jobs. Hell, the locals from all around probably had a hand in wrecking that place. People there felt just as angry about Treasure Island as folks here did about Mowgli's palace. Plus, there are rumors that Disney had released their aquarium stock into the local waters when they closed, including sharks. Who wouldn't want to take a few swings at some merchandise after that? Well, what I'm getting at is that this blog about Cheshire Island got me thinking. Even though many years had passed since its closing, I figured it might be cool to do some urban exploration at Mowgli's Palace. Take some photos, write about my experience, and probably see if there's anything I could take home as a memento. I'm not going to say I wasted no time in getting there. Because honestly, it took me another year after I first found that Treasure Island article to get around to going up to Emerald Isle. Over the course of that year, I did a lot of research on the Palace Resort, or rather, I tried to. Naturally, no official Disney site or resource made my mention of the place that had been succumbed cleaned. Even older, however, was that nobody before myself had apparently thought to blog about that place or even post a photo. None of the local TV or newspaper sites had one word about that place. It, though that, that was to be expected since they all had swung Disney's way, they wouldn't be out there lo loading their embarrassment, you know. Recently, I learned that corporations can actually ask Google, for example, to remove links from search results. Basically, for no good reason. Looking back, it's probably not that nobody spoke of the resort, but rather, their words were made inaccessible. So, in the end, I could barely find a place. All I had to go on was an old-as-hell map I received in the mail back in the 90s. It was a promotional item sent out to people who had recently been to Disney World, and I guess since I had been there in the late 80s, that was recent. I didn't really intend to hang on to it. It just got shoved in with my books and comics from my childhood. I only remembered it months into my research, and even then it took me another few weeks to locate the storage bin my parents had showed it, shoved it all into. But I did find it. Locals were no help, as most were transplants who had moved to the beach in recent years, or old residents who just sneered at me and made rude gestures the second I managed to say, Where would I find Mowgli's? The dr drive took me through an inordinately long corridor of overgrowth. Tropical, tropical plants that had run rampant and overpopulated the area mixed with native species of flora that actually belonged there and, and had tried to reclaim the land. I was in awe when I reached the front gates of the resort. Tremendous monolithic wooden gates whose supports to either side look like they must have been cut from giant sequ sequoias. The gate itself had been gouged in several places by woodpeckers and eaten away at the base by burrowing insects. Hanging on the gate was a sheet of metal with some random scrap with hand-painted letters scrawled in, the ba in black, Abandoned by Disney. Clearly the handiwork of some past local or an employee who wanted to make some small protest. The gates were open enough to walk through, but not to drive, so grabbing my digital camera and the map, whose flip side showed a layout of the resort, I set off on foot. The inner grounds of the place were just as overgrown as the entryway. Palm trees stood unintended and ragged among piles of their own 
coconuts. Banana plants similarly stood at, in their own stinking, bud-riddled refuse. There was this sort of clash between order and chaos as carefully planted rows of perennial flowers mixed with obnoxious tall weeds and stinking blackened mushrooms. All that remained of any outdoor structures were broken, rotting wood and various charred bits of unidentifiable material. What was most likely an information booth or an outdoor bar was now simply a pile of assorted debris, chopped up past vandalism and ravaged by weather. The most interesting thing on the grounds was a statue of Baloo, the friendly bear from the Jungle Book, which stood in a sort of country yard in front of the main building. He was frozen in a jovial wave toward no one, staring into empty space with a silly toothy grin as bird shit covered whole swaths of its fur and vines has snarled its platform. I approached the main building, the palace only to find the outside of the building covered in graffiti where the original paint had peeled and chipped away. The front doors were, were just open. They had been taken off their hinges and were stolen. Above the front doors or, or the grepping mall where they had been, someone had once again painted Abandoned by Disney. I wish I could tell you about all the awesome stuff I saw inside the palace. Forgotten statues, abandoned cash registers, a full-fledged secret society of homeless bums, but no. The inside of the building was so stark, so bare, that I actually think people had stolen the molding of the walls. Anything that was too big to steal, counters, desks, giant fake trees, they were all resting amid this empty echo chamber. That amplified my every step like a slow rat a tat of a machine gun. I checked the floor pan plan and headed all to all the locations that might seem in any way interesting. The kitchen, as well you imagine, an industrial food prep area with all appliances and space, no expenses spread. Every glass surface was broken, every door knocked off its hinges, every metal surface kicked and dented, and the entire place smelled like very old piss. The huge freezer, not even remotely cool now, had row upon row of empty shelf space. Hooks hung from the ceiling, probably for hanging cuts of meat, and I stood inside for a moment. I noticed they were swinging. Each hook swung in a random direction, but their movements were so slow and small that it was almost impossible to see. I figured it must have been caused by my footsteps, so I stopped one from swinging by clutching it to my fist, and then carefully letting go. But within seconds, it started to swing once more. The bathrooms were in much the same state as the rest of the place. Just like treasure the Treasure Island Resort, Someone had methodically smashed each porcelain commode with coconuts and other implements. There was about half inch of rancid, stinking, stagnant water on the floor, so I didn't stay there very long. What's odd is that the toilets and sinks all dripped, leaked, or, or just ran freely. It seemed to me that they should have shut the water off long, long ago. There were plenty of rooms in the resort, but naturally, I didn't have time to look through them all. The few I did peer into were similarly wrecked, and I didn't expect to find anything there. I thought there were actually a television or radio in one room, as I really think I heard a quiet conversation coming out. Though, it was like a whisper, probably my own breathing echoing in a silence or just another case of the sound flowing water playing tricks on my mind. This is what it sounded like. I, I don't believe it. I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Your father told you. 
I know, I know that sounds ridiculous. I just telling you what I experienced, why I thought there might have been something running in that room, or worse. Some vagrants who had holed up in there and probably would have knifed me. At the front doors of the palace again, I feared I hadn't found anything of note and have washed the trip up. As I looked out the door, I noticed something interesting in the courtyard that I had apparently missed. Something that would have given me at least one thing to show for all my trouble, even if it was just a photograph. There was a lifelike statue of a python, maybe 80 feet long, coiled up and, and stunning itself on a pedestal right in the center of the arena uh, area. It was almost time for the sun to start setting till light fell onto the object in the perfect way for our photograph. I approached the python and snapped a photo. Then I stood on my tones and snapped another. I moved closer again to get the details of its face. Slowly, casually, the python lifted its head, looked, at, looking, looked directly into my eyes, turned and slithered off the pedestal, across the grass and into the trees, all 80 feet of it. Its head long disappeared into the woods before its tail even left the stunning spot. Disney had released all their exotic animals onto the grounds. Right there on my floor pan map was the reptile house. I should have known. I've read about the sharks at Treasure Isle. And I should have known they've done this. I was dumbfounded. Just utterly stupefied. My mouth must have been hanging open for the longest time before... I came down to earth and snapped it shut. I blinked a few times and backed away from where the snake had been back toward the palace. Even though it was totally gone, I still wasn't taking any chances. I backed my way into the building. It took a few deep breaths and slapped to my own face to get myself right in the head after that. I looked for a place to sit down and my legs were feeling like a bit like jelly at this point. Of course, there was no place for to sit down unless I wanted to recline in the broken glass and dead leaf carpet or hold myself on a desk of unquestionably great reliability. I had, I had seen some stairs near the palace lobby and decided to go and have a seat there until I felt better. The scare case was far enough away from the front of the building. To be rel relatively clean, save for a starting accumulation of dust, I pull a wedge of metal off the wall, once again painted with the Abandoned by Disney motto I had been accustomed to. I placed the wedge on the stairs and sat on it, to keep at least somewhat clean. The stairway led downward, below ground level, using my camera flash as a sort of improvised flashlight, I could see the staircase ended in a metal mesh door with a padlock, a sign on the door, a real sign, red. Mascots only. Thank you. This perked up my spirits a little bit for two reasons. One, a mascots only area would have definitely had some interesting stuff back in the day. Two, the padlock was still in place. Nobody had gone down there. Not the vandals, not the looters, nobody. This was the one place I could actually explore and perhaps find something interesting to photograph or wannably steal. I had come to the palace essentially, agreeing with myself that it had been okay to take anything I wanted because, hey, abandoned. It didn't take much to bust the lock. Well, actually, that's wrong. It didn't take much to bust the metal plate on the wall that the padlock ha ha was hooked to. Time and decay had done most of the work for me. And I was able to be bend the metal plate enough to pull the screws out of the wall. Something nobody else had apparently thought of or hadn't been able to do at that time. The mascot's only area was star startling and very 
welcomed change for an Earth's ability in that scene. For one, every second of or a third fluorescent light overhead was illuminated, even though they flickered and faded randomly. Also, nothing had been stolen or broken, even if age and exposure were definitely taking their toll. Tables had notepads and pens. There were clocks, even a punch-in clock on a wall com with complete with filled-out time cards. Chairs were scattered around, and there was even a small break room with an old static-filled television and long-rotted-out food and drink on the counters. It was like one of those post-apocalypse movies where everything is left in a state of evacuation. As I walked the maze-like sub-basement hallways of mascots only area, the sights just became more and more interesting as I went further. Desks and tables were knocked over, paper scattered, and almost melded with the damp floor. And a large carpet of mold was slowly overtaking the large, rotting crimson floor covering. Everything was just sort of squishy. Anything wood disintegrated into mush when I applied even the least amount of force. And clothing items hanged on hooks in one of the rooms simply fell to moist threads if I tried to unhook them. One thing that annoyed me was the light was becoming more sparse and unreliable as I went further into the dark, suffocating depths of the place. Eventually, I reached a black and yellow striped door with the words, Character Prep 1, then styled on it. The door wouldn't open at first. I figured this was probably where costumes were kept, and I definitely wanted a photograph of that twisted, stinking mess. Try as I might, whatever angle or trick I tried, the door wouldn't budge. That is, until I gave up and started to walk away. That was where... That was when there was a slight popping sound and the door creaked open slowly. Inside the room was completely dark, pitch black. I used the camera flash to look for a light switch in the wall by the door, but there was nothing. As I made my search, I was jarred out of my sense of excitement by a loud electrical buzz. A row of lights overhead suddenly flashed to life, flickering and fading in and out like the rest I had passed. It took a second for my eyes to adjust, and it seemed like the light was going to keep getting brighter until all the bulbs exploded. But just when I thought it would reach that critical stage, the lights dimmed a bit and steadied. The room was exactly as I pictured it. Various Disney costumes hung on the walls, fully put together like strange cartoon cadavers, hung from invisible nooses. There was an entire rack of flying cloths and native clothes on hangers towards the back. What I found odd in what I wanted to photograph right away was a Mickey Mouse costume at the center of the room, unlike the other costumes. It was lying on its back in the center of the floor, like a murder victim. The fur on the costume was rotten and shedding, creating bare patches. What was even odder, however, was the coloring of the costume. It was a, like a photo negative of the actual Mickey Mouse. Black where he should be white, and white where he should be black. His normally red overalls were light blue. The sight was off-putting, though that I'm actually put off photographing the thing until last. I took a picture of the costume hanging on the walls, upward angles, downward angles, side shots to show an entire row of frozen putrid cartoon faces, some with plastic eyes missing. Then I decided to stage a shot, just one of the bed ragged characters' heads on a slick, grimy floor. I reached for the headpiece of Donald Duck costume and carefully removed it so the thing wouldn't fall apart in my hands. As I looked into the face of wide-eyed, moldering head, a loud clattering sound made me jump with fright. I looked down at my feet and between my shoes was a human skull. It had fallen out of the mascot's head and scattered into pieces at my, f my feet. 
Only the empty face and lower jaw remained, staring up at me. I dropped the duck head immediately, as you expect, and moved for the door. As I stood in the doorway, I looked back to the skull on the floor. I had to take a picture of it, you know. I had to. For any number of reasons, that may seem silly, but only if you don't think it through. I need proof of what happened, especially if Disney was going to somehow make this go away. I had no doubt in my mind right from the start that even if it was just gross negligence, Disney was responsible for this. That's when Mickey, the photo negative opposite Mickey, in the middle of the floor started to get up. First sitting up, then climbing to its feet, the Mickey Mouse costume, or whoever was inside of it, stood there at the center of the room, its fake face just staring directly at me as I mumbled, No. Over and over and over. With shaking hands, I violently flash thrashing heart, and legs had once again turned jelly. I managed to lift the camera and aim, aim it at the opposite creature now quietly sizing me up. The digital camera screen displayed only dead pixels in the shape of the thing. It was a perfect silhouette of the Mickey Mouse costume. As the camera show uh, moved in my unsteady hands, the dead pixel spread, marrying the screen wherever Mickey's outline moved to. Then the camera died, went black and quiet and broken. I raised my eyes once again to the Mickey Mouse costume. Hey, it said in a hush, perverted but perfectly executed Mickey Mouse voice. Want to see my head come off? It started to pull its at its own head, working its clumsy glove-clad fingers around its neck with clawing impatient movements similar to a wounded man trying to pull himself free of a predator's jaws. As it worked its digits around its neck, so much blood, so much thick, chunky, yellow blood. I turned away as I heard the sickening tearing of cloth and flesh, only cared about getting away. Above the doorway, out of this room, I saw the final message clawed into the middle of, with bone or fingernails. Abandoned by God. I never got the pictures out, out of the camera. I never wrote the blog entry about it. After I ran from that place, fled for my sanity, if not even my if very life, I knew why Disney didn't want anyone to know about this place. They didn't want anyone like me getting in. They didn't want anything like that getting out.